Hi, we're going to look at a chapter in this book here, Frequently Asked Questions in Quantitative Finance, second edition. We're going to look at the chapter or the section, the Frequently Asked Question on Modern Portfolio Theory. Modern Portfolio Theory is a very clever idea. It goes back to Harry Markowitz in the 1950s, and it, uh, he, he won a Nobel Prize for it. Its concept is very straightforward. Mathematics is very simple, basic probability, very profound stuff. A few quirks about using it in practice, but it is still used in practice to some extent. Let's kind of motivate this, justify this, by looking at the example of a coin toss. Imagine you've got a hundred dollars to spend, to spend, sorry, to bet on the toss of a coin, and you've got a biased coin. This has got a 55% chance of heads. Now, you could bet the hundred dollars on the on this, this coin. Suppose you're betting at evens, then you've got a 55% chance of, of winning a hundred dollars, but then you've got a 45% chance of losing everything. But that's still a very good expected return but it comes with a lot of risk because of that 45% chance of um, losing your money, all your money. So let's think, let's, instead of putting all our um, money in um, uh, the one bet, let's spread the money out, maybe divide it into um, 100 bets of $1, either on the, the same coin 100 times, or maybe you've got 100 coins. Let's think, let's think of 100 coins. Simultaneously, if you're going to toss these 100 coins, they're all equally biased, but independent, so there's no color correlation between them. Uh, and you're going to bet $1 on each of these. Actually, let, let, let's, let's go full math um, and, and divide it up into N small bets. Okay, N might be 10, 100, 1,000, etc. Um, now, or as there's a, a, a chance of, a 45% chance of losing everything with a single toss of the coin, if you're betting uh, on 10 coins, then you've got well, 40.45 to the power of 10 chance of losing everything, which is a you know, much smaller risk. Um, equally, well not equally, but 0.55 to the power of 10 uh, chance of of winning all of those coin tosses, which is also very small. So what, what actually happens when you, you're dividing your, your money up across lots of different bets is the expectation doesn't change. That's because expectations are additive, but the risk, the standard deviation drops off. I'll, I'll give you some orders of magnitude. So we're going to have n, n bets, divide our money, whatever it is, into n bets. That means for each bet, our expected return is proportional to um, 1 over n. That's each bet. That's for each bet. Our standard deviation for each bet is also proportional to 1 over n. Okay, but what about across all of the bets? Well, you can add up expectations, so that means that the expectation is, well, it's exactly what it would have been for putting all your money up on a single, uh, on one coin toss. But the standard deviation is different. Now, you cannot add standard deviations in the way that you can add expectations. Uh, but you can add variances, as long as um, you've got independent coin tosses. Now, the variance, of course, for a single coin toss is proportional to 1 over n squared, because the variance is the square of the standard, de standard deviation. And if you've got n of these, then the total variance across all of these n coins is proportional to n over n squared. Otherwise, 1 over n. So the standard deviation, that's because you can add variances if they're uh, independent. So the standard deviation across all is proportional to the square root of that 1 over root n. So if you've got um, independent coin tosses, then as n gets larger and larger, the, the risk decreases, and, but you converge to the expected return. And that's great. So how does that apply in um, how does that apply in finance? 
Well, the way that applies in finance is there's a little bit more maths to it, but not much more. We, we have mu as the um, expected return for a, a single stock or stock i, call it stock i, and we've got sigma i as being the standard deviation of the return for stock i, and then you have a correlation i, j, between these two stocks, a number between minus one and plus one. Uh, of course, the correlation of a stock with itself is equal to one, so rho i, i equals one. <coughs> and if we have w i as the, the fraction we invest in stock i, then the, ex the, the um, expected return is just the weighted sum of all the individual expectations. So that's mu pi. The pi just means, stands for portfolio. Standard deviation more complicated because it's, it's going to take into account the correlations. So this is the, this is the, the expression, uh, this, the thing inside the square root is the variance. And that expression, if, if you have rho i j being zero, except for rho i i being one, then that collapses the same expression for um, when we had, did the coin tossing. But now with correlations, it's a little bit more complicated. Not much more, but a little bit more complicated. So uh, those are the formulae we have to work with. We're given the mu's, we're given the sigmas, we're given the correlations, we get to choose the w's. Now the question is, how do we choose the w's? So let's have a look at the different, at choosing the w's. I'm going to draw, start drawing the following picture of expected return against risk. And suppose we've got three assets. We're going to have uh, A, B, C. Three assets to start with. In practice, we'd have as many as, as there are. Well, we can make some obvious uh, observations already about these. For example, uh, stock B is rubbish. If you're going to put all your money into one stock, stock B is not it. It has quite a high risk for a low here for quite a low expected return. So forget B. Um, what about A and C? Well, C's got a good expected return, very high, double that of A, but it's also got much higher risk. Okay. So at this point, we, we actually can't say whether we like A or C. Some people might like A because they like less risk. Some people like, like C um, because they want more risk and get and a corresponding higher expected return. But that's investing all your money in individual stocks. What if you decide to split your money about? I mean, suppose you put a third of your money into A, B, and C. Well, you, you might get a point here, for example. Um, if you put half your money into C and a quarter into each of A and B, you might have some dot up here. Anyway, you can imagine that as you are dividing up your, all your money in different combinations with different weights, you'll get different dots. And where these dots are depends on the correlations and the, all the other parameters. Now, obviously, some of these dots are better than other dots, like that, that dot there is better than this dot. So whatever that portfolio is here, it's a pretty good portfolio, at least compared with, with other ones. Um, so what Markovitz said was, let's do some optimization here. Let's, let's say that we are comfortable with a certain level of risk. So let's suppose this is the level of risk here that we are comfortable with, that we want to just have that amount of standard deviation in our portfolio. So what Markovitz said was, let's optimize. Let us vary the Ws while holding that risk constant, so that means holding this expression here constant. Now, in optimization terms, that's a constraint. The, there are two constraints here. There's a constraint that we want to fix the um, standard deviation for the moment, but we also want to fix the, the weights have to add up to one. Now, this can all be done. Everything I'm doing now can be done very simply in a spreadsheet, Excel using the solver add-in, really straightforward. So let's do that. Suppose we're just going to choose that level of risk, constrain that square root expression to be whatever that number is, and vary the Ws. Now as we vary the Ws, what you'll find happening 
is you get different expected returns. And so this is where the optimization comes in. You just try to find the maximum, the highest expected return for a given level of risk. And that, this optimization tells you what the Ws are, what the weights should be to give you that point. And then you do exactly the same thing. You just, with different level of risk, suppose you choose that level of risk. Well, we get another dot here. The maximize the expected return for a given level of risk. And we can do this for in every level of risk we choose, and we will get a curve like this. And this is called the efficient frontier. Efficient frontier. Portfolios on the, that efficient frontier have the highest expected return for a given level of risk. That's what efficient means. So each of those dots is a portfolio of A, B, and C, and all the stocks you've got. Uh, one interesting thing about this is you'll, you'll find it has this, this curving shape. And if you say, for example, well, I'm very risk averse. I really only, I'm only comfortable with a 5% risk, standard deviation. So can you, Paul, can you construct me a portfolio using these stocks, A, B, and C, that has only a 5% risk? Well, it's not possible in this particular case, clearly, because the, the, the way the curve comes down. If you are going to put all your money into A, B, and C in some combination, then you cannot get your portfolio risk down to 5%. That's what that, this picture is saying. So when you do the optimization, it will throw out some sort of error. Okay. That's great, that's the efficient frontier. Now, could stop there, but there's something else we can do, and that is throw in the a thing called the, um, the risk-free investment. So suppose that there's an investment here and it's 4%. Risk-free just means putting the money, if we're putting the money in the bank, you can't lose the money, you're gonna get 4% per annum. What if we decide to um, throw that into the mix? Let, let's suppose, for example, we, we, we thought we'll, we'll combine the risk-free investment, this chap here, with stock B. What does that do for us? Well, if we put all our money in stock, in, sorry, in the risk-free investment, we would be here. If we put all our money in B, we would be here. If we put half our money in A, in risk-free and half in B, we would get a point here. Okay, a quarter in B and three quarters in risk-free would be here. A quarter in risk-free and three quarters in B would be here. We can get anywhere along this line by weighting our money between risk-free and B. In fact, we can actually go all the way up there. All of these from this point onwards mean we've actually borrowed at 4% to, to invest in the stock. Um, that's great. So we get, we've just introduced a whole extra load of um, uh, possible portfolios by introducing the risk-free. Well, what we do now is we say, can we somehow maximize this? What's the, what's the line with the biggest slope that goes up the highest? Because the further we are up here, the better, because that's high expected return and low risk. Well, we can, if we go through A, we do it. What, what if we go through risk-free and this point here, well, we can get that portfolio there, we can get there. In fact, we can get anywhere along that line. The line that is tangential to the efficient frontier. Now, tangential just means it goes through the same point where it touches, so they have the same gradient. So this is a special thing called the, the market portfolio, portfolio or the tangency portfolio. Okay. And we can get anywhere along that line by investing in risk-free, this, this special, special portfolio here. As, as before, if we put all our money in risk-free, we're here. All our money in the special portfolio, we are here. Half and half, we are here. Borrow at the risk-free rate, and we can get anywhere up there. And that's called the capital market line. Market line. So here are the possible investments. Here's the efficient frontier. Here's the market portfolio, the one that's tangential to the efficient frontier. And there is the capital market line. Get all the way anywhere along there.
very, very simple. Can all be done in a spreadsheet. Here's such a spreadsheet. I've color coordinated this. Anything in yellow means the parameters that we put in, for example, these, these parameters to do with the stocks. These are the correlations. Obviously, along here, the correlations are all one. And these are the weights. These are the things that we vary to optimize, to do the optimization. Negative just means we've, we've actually sold the stock short. And that's just the sum of all the, port, the, all the weights must add up to one. This is the efficient frontier without the um, um, risk free investments at the moment. And then the way the optimization works is we use Excel Solver. We specify what target return do we want and then let Excel Solver do the business where it varies the weights to maximize the expected return. And that's the maximum here. And those are the weights. And just change this as you change this. See here, I've got down here a specified level of risk. As you vary risk, you get different expected return with different weights. And then you just vary the risk bit by bit. It gives you a different expected return and that gives you the efficient frontier. Then you throw in the, the um, risk free. And there you go. You have the capital market line. So that is really very good. The only thing, other thing to say really is that the, the, the maths is straightforward, the optimization is straightforward. The, the bit that lets it down is really just the parameters uh, because they're very unstable. The volatilities change a bit. Drifts, well, who knows? I mean, are we in a, in a, um, a bull market, a bear market, um, going sideways? We never know until it's too late. And also the correlations can be very unstable. They might be nice and stable during normal market conditions, but then along comes a crash and everything suddenly becomes very highly correlated. So things, parameters change. Okay, so that was just in a nutshell, the um, uh, mon portfolio theory as seen in frequently asked questions. So thank you very much for listening to me.